So historically, uh, the intent was to provide clean, healthy and safe places for people to live and to go to school and uh, day services things where people were controlled. Um, minimal standards of care were defined as quality. And most people with disabilities were taken care of years ago in institutions away from families and communities. Care was basic and it was often custodial and plans were developed by professionals. In the 1960s, there was a new focus on continuous training and development for people with disabilities. And up until the 1980s, um, many people with dis disabilities received a certain amount of education and training. But however, having said that, it was very much around looking at what professionals believed was the level of training that they could achieve, which was not, it didn't push people, it just contained them really, although they called it education training. So it was typically in the 1980s, and I was there working and in these, well not working in them, but associated with them at some times, workshops, which I'm sure a lot of people still have these workshops, community-based schools and group homes. Um, and at this time, the client was trained in programs according to service guidelines as to what could be afforded within, like you had a wood workshop and you had um, perhaps an art department and various other things that people were just put into um, because that's what was there not because we had a, a, a dynamic approach and lots of different facilities available. Um, but there was a shift now from the definition of quality being about how people are cared for. We started to, to, to introduce goal setting and indeed there were um, requirements, particularly, well, I know in UK there were requirements at that time starting to come in um, that um, the definition of quality was about reaching goals. Since the 1980s and the advent of person-centered approaches, the focus is on support, coordination, and services which are necessary to develop people to have a full and healthy lifestyle. So, um, flexible supports, enabling people to connect with their communities as neighbours within that community, as friends within the community, as family members, and indeed at times um, when you look across the spectrum, um, at, as paid co-workers within communities as well. So quite a big shift from that going back to pre-1960s to 80s, uh, where people were contained um, and did the same thing basically the same little job if they had one all their lives, to moving forward to people developing and actually having a more fulfilled life and opportunities. Look at these early approaches. Um, this family tree identifies 11 early, pro early approaches to person-centered planning. And this was developed between 1979 and 1992. And we can see those general influences that are, that are coming along. Um, so since 1992, there's been uh, more variations that have developed and um, a growing number of agencies and practitioners have developed their own methods around these approaches. Um, so for instance, essential lifestyle planning is widely practiced and it's continuing to, to spread. Um, the person-centered planning, the whole person-centered planning methodology that we see in, in the 1990s um, with essential lifestyle planning, map and path work, um, which we're gonna have a look in more detail at, that whole dynamic of group action planning, which is important, um, families first getting involved 
and even going back to 1980 and, and starting to look at 24 hour planning. Now this was quite dynamic at the time that we actually saw somebody as a 24 hour person uh, in the first instance that they had different aspects of their lives. They had um, their day, leisure activities, work activities, evening times, meal times, sleep times, uh, where previously it had just been a person like a being in an institution. And I do remember those days and I remember those people. So it, it seems not so far off, but I guess for a lot of people, it seems a long way back. But uh, it's within my working lifetime anyway that we've seen all this change. So thinking about choice and opportunity. Um, it's not offered by the system that everyone has a basic right to choice. Choices aren't always perfect. We all make choices. We make good and bad choices based on our own values, things like peer pressure, um, wanting new experiences or avoiding unpleasant experiences. Or sometimes we make choices just to please other people. But it's not a reason to live in an unsafe place or to live in an unhealthy place, to smell bad, for instance, and to have bad personal hygiene, to inflict injury or, or to yourself or to other people. So this is the balance with choice um, that we need to, um, oh gosh, I've got two things going here. Sorry, I'm, I didn't flick that at the time onto that particular one. We need to consider that um, people who um, now have choices still have to live within the human environment. So it's, it's about duty of care as well as choice. And all of us are bound by certain restrictions. So if for, for all of us, if we choose not to use per, um, personal hygiene, people will avoid us. And therefore, there's an outcome for that. Uh, and so we make our decisions and choices based on those particular sorts of factors. For instance, are we keeping our friends happy? Now, if you have an autistic spectrum condition, you may not actually read the fact that other people are offended if you smell badly and are avoiding you. So it sort of doesn't matter to you in that respect. Uh, it may be that you have sensory issues and you don't understand that you smell badly. And so why would you wash anyway? So you're making choices not based on the reality of living among people. And this is, this is one of the biggest dilemmas when we're handing over choice and, and encouraging people to make their choices, to recognize that there are restrictions for every human being. So choices, yep, it's fine, it's available, it's there, but there are parameters and boundaries for every single human being around choice. So thinking about the people, what's, um, who's important to the person to help them with making choice? And who, who does the person want to be with? That's a big choice. We all make choices about who we want to spend time with and who we actually don't want to spend time with. It's important that we think about who this individual wants to spend their time with <clears throat> and thinking about places. Where do they want to be? Where do they want to live? Where do they want to go to work or to school or, or, or college or whatever? Where do they want to spend their leisure time? And thinking about whoop, ah, activities. What things do they want to do <coughs> with their time? Um, how do they what, want to spend Sunday afternoons, for instance? Um, it can be a dilemma for a lot of us, but these things are important. And then thinking about opportunities, people with disabilities must have the authority to make use of regular opportunities that a community offers in order to make their choices. Now, it could be that we have the ability to make a choice by looking at things on the internet or by reading magazines and, and, and 
media about certain things that we make our choices around. If you have an autistic spectrum condition, you may be less likely to be able to pull those abstracts together so that you can then get that picture in your head about what it is that you want to do from um, media information, from um, pictures, from stories. So it may be that you actually need to have tasters and actually go and experience something just for a short while and then make your choice about whether it's something you want to repeat or not. It may need to be more interactive. Um, now, control is shared wherever public funds are used. And I think, again, this is something that we have to be very realistic about. You know, person centered planning isn't utopia. It would be lovely if we could all have a Rolls Royce, probably. It would be lovely if we, we could all be airline pilots, if that's what we want, or brain surgeons or whatever. But, but the reality is that sometimes money, um, uh, characteristics and skills do actually inhibit the, the parameters of what we're able to do with our lives. And that's, the real, that's, that's real. And I think that the, the message needs to come across that it's not like we give the choice and therefore anything goes. With choice comes responsibility, comes opportunity and responsibility. So we need to be actually developing both um, in the individual so that they understand those responsibilities. But maybe, maybe we can't be an airline pilot, but maybe we can go flying occasionally, you know, there's, there's very, you can take things from the top degree of, yeah, that's what I want to be, that's what I want to do, to something that is doable and something that is achievable. And as I said, when control is shared, so is responsibility. I think possibly a lot of professionals, when you're talking about person centre planning, one of their, their, their concerns is, Oh, so you're going to you're going to just hand over to everybody. Um, so th to these people, all the, all their choices and responsibilities and they won't be able to handle that and, and they can't do that. And so, so we have to be pragmatic to some extent as facilitators. Yeah, we look for the dreams and yes, we look for the for the earth, but there are restrictions within that as well. And that's real life. You can't get away from that. 